spectrophotometry. And basically that is what the practical is all about. And what this is, um, you can easily find out when you go to the videos that I sent uh, around in this link. Uh, so please, please, please have a look at that stuff. Yeah? It's conceptually not terribly difficult. I showed it to my 10-year-old uh, son, and he said, yes, I understand that. And I thought, okay, fine. If he understands it, then I'm absolutely confident that um, you will understand it. Are you smarter than a 10-year-old? <laughs> right? <laughs> the, the, I don't want any confessions here, right? <laughs> Are you smarter than a 10-year-old? Uh, it could be the title of a program. Actually, it is a television program, isn't it? Uh, you can learn a lot from it. Uh, so please have a look at these uh, videos and try to uh, do the, the, the exercise, the homework. And hopefully this time I won't have too many technical problems that I can send out the results then uh, fairly swiftly. Um, okay, what this spectrophotometry... Um, is basically, it's a, it's a really cool method to help us with the stuff that we have done so far. Just as a recap, so far what we have done is a lot of calculations. Uh, we were talking about concentrations, about molarity, and so on and so forth. But here's a question for you guys. Obviously, this concentration stuff, this molarity stuff, seems to be quite important because I'm harping on about it all the time. But how do we actually measure concentration in real life? Let's assume, and it might be a little bit... Oh, no, I've just seen something. Ah, fantastic, we don't have to assume something. I just saw something. Yes, can I borrow that for a moment? What is this? This is oasis, right? Let's assume we have oasis here. What color is it? Green. <laughs> it's interesting that you say green, actually. Uh, somebody said green, at least. Well, it is uh, red, uh, at least to my eyes. But... We obviously uh, know that there are people who are uh, red-green blind. And, uh, for example, my dad is one. Uh, we have hell of a fun at traffic lights. Um, anyway, so this is red. Now, obviously, it contains... What does it contain? Main ingredient, sugar... Next one, sugar. Uh, third one, sugar. Oh, there's a little bit of water in it as well. And some tasty things. Uh, so there's sugar in it. But we want to know what is the concentration of this sugar. Is there a lot of sugar in it? Well, obviously it says, or the tin. Uh, but uh, how much is in there? How much is in there? How can we figure that out? I will nick it later again. How can we figure it out? What is the concentration of sugar in Oasis? How can we figure it out? Any ideas? Okay, imagine you have a bottle of wine. It's something that a lot of students don't have too, too much a problem in, uh, you know, figuring out. And it says there's alcohol in it. How much alcohol? How can you figure out how much alcohol? What is the concentration of alcohol in a bottle of wine? How can we measure it? How can we measure that we haven't been diddled? 
uh, that reminds me of uh, of a picture that I, or a picture that I have seen. Two guys and a dog sitting there. One guy says, "Can you feel anything?" And there were smoking spliffs. Can you feel anything? And the second guy says, "No, I think we have been diddled." And the dog says, "Oh my God, I can see colors." <laughs> Obviously, the dog got the spliff because dogs can't see colors. Anyway. How do we know that it is in there what it's supposed to be in? So we need a way to measure concentrations very easily, hopefully, and hopefully in a way that doesn't destruct our, uh, our, our bottle of wine or, uh, you know, the, uh, the oasis. How can we do that? Well, there is something that is called the Beer-Lambert law. <coughs> and on the videos, you will find a very good explanation of what this is. The basic principle is just simply Let's assume we have our pot of oasis. Yeah. And we shine light through it. So light comes from the side. And we just hold a sort of a light source towards our pot of oasis. And then we measure, bless you, and then we measure how much light comes out at the other end. So that's the experimental approach to measuring concentrations. But why on earth would that work? And to answer this question, I want to ask you a completely different question where you think, oh my God, is he gone completely bonkers? And the answer is probably yes. But have you ever thought about why is a leaf green? Why is it green? Or in, in, the, in the words of somebody over there, it might be red. Why is a leaf green? Or why is the oasis red? Green. Or green? You're confusing me. Okay, let's let's look for something neutral where you can't ah uh, ah. Uh. Why is that sort of lime color? Would you agree with me? Ah, good, thank you. Why? What happens? Colors are everywhere. What happens? It reflects the wavelength back. It reflects the wavelength back. Yes, that's a... What wavelengths? <coughs> On the color. Uh-huh. Does that make sense? You say, uh-uh, at least somebody's honest. Right, let's see what happens when there is light. When there is light, for example, white light, like this one here, white light is a mixture of all different colors of light. And this white light is composed of, well, here's sort of a spectrum of light. 
And light is just another form of energy. We are able to see light only in a very small range. And this range goes from uh, a wavelength of 400 nanometers to about 800 nanometers. But in fact, this is only part of a very wide spectrum. So for example, uh, next to the red, we have infrared, that is more than red, redder than red, if you like. How do we can, we, can we see infrared? Can we feel infrared? We feel it as warmth, as heat energy. On the other side, we have got ultraviolet rays. Can we see it? Obviously not. Can we feel it? Yes, we can feel it when the skin cancer comes along. Uh, that is what causes cancer. Lots of animals have a different spectrum. So, for example, flies, common house flies, they are blind for red. So, when you keep them in a room that has a red light in it, uh, for them it's darkness. Honeybees see pretty much uh, further down in the ultraviolet light. And if you ever uh, get your hands on an ultraviolet lamp, put a flower under an ultraviolet light, and you will see absolutely marvelous patterns that we usually don't see, but the, but the honeybees see it. You see almost like landing strips for the bees that guide them to uh, where they should go. So this is light. And I told you, light is energy, contains energy. And each wavelength carries a specific energy with it. So, who cares? How is that related to colors? Well, if we shine light, oops, if we shine light of the right energy onto an atom. <coughs> so here we have the atom, and here we have the an electron whizzing around. If we shine the light onto an atom, then there's a good chance that the light will hit the electron. And if the energy is right, then the electron will jump to a different level. In a way, it is almost like the light is going to kick the electron into a higher level. But it has to have exactly the right energy for that. Not right energy, nothing happens. The electron won't jump. Right energy, the electron jumps. And sooner or later, it goes back to its old state, but uh, that's a different story. But obviously, what happens then is that the energy of the light is, so energy of the light of light is absorbed. by the electron. And you can imagine, when the right energy hits the electron and the electron jumps up, the light is no longer. The energy is all gone. And that is exactly what happens when we see colors. When we see colors, when we have white light, there is all sorts of wavelengths in white light.
And it is a crude mixture from blue light to red light. If it's white, all the wavelengths are there. Now, if we shine that onto our little atom with the electron, certain wavelengths will have exactly the right energy to kick the electron up. They will be absorbed. So certain wavelengths... are absorbed because they have the right energy. And the other wavelengths, they don't do anything. They just simply go through. Or they get reflected or something like that. Yeah? So let's say this one here, this one gets absorbed So that is eliminated, and the others get bounced off, get reflected. And these are the wavelengths that we still see. We don't see the absorbed one, because here the energy has gone. We just see the other ones. So... When we see the color red, here we see the color red. What happens? Well, all the, all the right wavelengths are absorbed, and only wavelengths that are not absorbed, we can see. So, in this case here, <coughs> only wavelengths that together, mixed together, give the color of red, are bounced back. Whereas, other wavelengths, in this case, what we would see as blue, is absorbed. So blue is absorbed. Bit weird. But blue and red are, give together a sort of whitish color. Why is a leaf green? Well, why is a leaf Green? Well, because the leaf itself, the chemicals in the leaf, especially the chlorophyll in the leaf, will absorb colors, will absorb the energy of the wavelength. And if you draw what is called an absorption spectrum, absorption spectrum and you put the different wavelengths down here so here you would have uh, blue here you would have red or something like that a leaf or the chlorophyll in the in, in the leaf will absorb very well blue light here is green. And then it will absorb red light. So here, that is what people call absorbance. It just simply means blue light has the right energy to kick some electrons, and red light has the right energy to kick electrons. Green light doesn't. So the green light basically 
is not touched, it is reflected. But the blue and the red light, they are picked up by the leaf. Okay? Does that make sense? So in autumn, leaves turn red. Why is that? What happens? You are on the right track. In autumn, chlorophyll is destroyed. So there's no longer absorbance of blue and red. Instead, you have other pigments in the plant, in the leaves. These are carotenoids. And these guys actually <coughs> absorb quite well in the green range. And also a little bit, I should draw it a little bit like that. Like that. These carotenoids absorb the blue and green light, but they don't touch the red light. So the red light is reflected, and because there's no more chlorophyll around, <coughs> this is what we actually see. We see the leaves being red. Because that is the wavelength that is no longer touched. Okay? Does that make sense? But how on earth is this going to help us when we want to measure some concentration of something? Well, in a way, we now know that light and certain wavelengths of the light interact with compounds in a solution. So let's say, here we have the oasis. And here we have some of these red colored molecules sitting in here that give it the red color or the green color. Now, when we shine light with the right wavelengths, and in this case, let's say we shine light that is just simply blue. Blue light, we know that blue light has the right energy to interact with these compounds in the oasis. It's the blue light that interacts. So it bumps into these molecules, these colored molecules. And it gets absorbed. So if I use the right wavelengths, the light, the energy of the light, gets eaten by the electrons in the compound. Let's think about what would happen if here's my oasis, or rather not oasis, here's just simply nothing with these electrons, with these red bits in it, and I shine blue light in it. Will it be absorbed? Will it be absorbed if there's nothing in that that it can interact with? No, it will just simply go through as it is. Yeah? Just simply whizzes through. So, I say no, nothing like that here. No red bits. Okay. Let's have one red bit. And let's shine blue light through it. 
Now the middle bit, this one here, will hit the light, will interact, and the energy will be absorbed. This one here, the top one, and the lower one won't be absorbed. So I get less light on the other side than I put in, because one of the lights has been absorbed. Yeah. So the intensity, people, some people call it I0 intensity, and this one would be a transmission or something like that. So the, the starting intensity is larger than, the, than what I get out on the other side because one of the beams is absorbed. How would the situation be if I have <coughs> lots of red bits? and I shine light through it. <laughs> this one here gets absorbed. This one here gets absorbed. This one perhaps makes it through. But you see, it's only one that gets through. And again, I can write, here is the initial uh, intensity, and here is the intensity after my thing. And again, here the intensity, the start intensity is much bigger than the what I get out. But what have we changed? We have only changed the concentration, so the only change is the Oops, sorry. Change in concentration of our red bits. That's only the only thing that we have changed in this case. So all we need to do really is we take a sample we shine the right light onto it. We measure how much light we shine at the beginning, at the starting point, And then we measure how much light we get out at the end. And we can say something about the concentration. We can compare the concentration of two different solutions. One solution gets, less, gets a very little light out, so we know that the concentration is high. Another solution gives lots of light out, so we know that the concentration of the thing that we are looking for is low. So we can basically say our intensity, or some people uh, measure it in a slightly different way. They measure not the intensity, but how much is absorbed, actually, and this is called the absorbance. The absorbance is directly proportional, that's this sort of fish thing, is directly proportional to the concentration of the compound that we are looking for. The higher the concentration, the higher the absorbance, the more gets absorbed. Now, here's another question for you. Let's say we have, we do this experiment. We do this experiment twice. First time, we have 
one container, and of course the container must allow the light to go through. If it's a black box or if it's a metal <coughs> cylinder, no light would go through anyway. There is no light going to be absorbed, so we can forget that. But this container must be able to let the light through. So, I do it with three again. So here we have three wavelengths hitting our container. Let's say one is interacting, two are getting out. So one is sort of, this one is interacting and kicking the electron into a new level. So two are going out. So I can use this to measure how much of these red blobs are sitting there. What is your prediction when I do exactly the same with this? How many go through? Still two going through? How many are going through? Sorry? Two? Well, one? Two or one? One. Sorry? Well, the first one, let's say, one is getting absorbed again in the first part here. Yeah? So we've got two here that get going through. And now, again, one gets absorbed again here. So only this one here then makes it through. Yeah, does that make sense? Now that's interesting. We can put these two containers together, actually. And it appears that our absorbance is also directly proportional to the length, how, how do I write this? I write it like that, with an L, length, of the, well, what do we want to call it? Path length, where the light has to move through. Length of the path. Length of the path. The longer I make this path by putting, let's say, if I put another container here, how much would go through? Nothing, really. It would be completely absorbed, probably, in the, in the very simplistic way I've drawn it here. Yeah? It's not exactly like that, but uh, we will come to that uh, in, in one of the later uh, sessions. But this is, in principle, how it works. So our absorbance, and it has abbreviated as APS. Some people, or very often, it is also called E for extinction. <coughs> extinction depends on the concentration and it depends on the length of the path. And if things depend on something, I've written it with this, with this fish alpha thingy, we can convert that into a true equation. We just need to put in a sort of a fudge factor. And so we can write extinction or absorbance is equal to the concentration of the substance that we are looking at <coughs> times the path length 
times, and here comes the fudge factor, and this is usually written with a, a, a Greek symbol. This is written with an epsilon that looks like this, sort of a three that is doing yoga. And now we have a nice equation. And this ex equation, this one, is actually called the Beer-Lambert law. So what does that mean in practical terms? And what is it about this fudge factor? Let me write it down again. E equals concentration times length times this epsilon. This fudge factor is also called the, the extinction factor. And this extinction factor is very specific for each substance. So, specific for a substance. Well, let's call it compound. And for a wavelength. and for a specific wavelength. And very different and different compounds have different extinction factors for different wavelengths. And usually you can look up these extinction uh, coefficients or extinction factors. There are tables, or you can do it on the interweb. And check out what is the extinction factor for, say, chlorophyll at a wavelength of 500 nanometers. And it will give you that. So, with our Beer Lambert law, we now are in a position to measure concentrations. So E equals C times length times extinction factor. And if I want to find out the concentration of something, all I need to do is I take a solution of Oasis put that into a spectrophotometer, which just produces a single wavelength. I measure what I put in at what comes out. And usually a spectrophotometer will show me, give me a reading. So, for example, my extinction is 0.5. And extinction is always unitless. So no unit. <laughs> Equals the concentration, which I don't know at that point, times, it is, that is the length of the path that the light goes through the solution. Very often you have these glass cuvettes. Have you seen them? Have you used them in your in practicals so far? Yeah? yeah? Usually they are, very often they are one centimeter in length. And for this particular compound, we can look it up on the web. It has, say, an extinction uh, coefficient of, say, 10. 
Now, what is the unit for that? The unit for this would be centimeter. Oh, sorry. One over centimeter and molar. That would be a standard unit for an extinction, extinction coefficient. Now, can we calculate how much is our concentration? How would you do that? We rearrange the equation, exactly. So we bring these two to that side. And we have extinction divided by length. And the extinction coefficient is our concentration. Our extinction was 0 0.5. Our length was one centimeter, and our extinction coefficient was 10, one over centimeter and molar. You see the centimeter cancel out. And we have basically sitting here 0 0.5 divided by 1 times 10 is 10. Molar to the power of minus 1. I can write 1 over molar as molar to the minus 1. 0 0.5 divided by 10, that gives 0 0.05. Am I right? Molar to the, well, 1 over molar to the minus 1 gives me molar. And here I've got my concentration. The concentration of my compound that when I put that in the spec, in the spectrophotometer, uh, usually biochemists have very endearing names for, uh, for specs because they are really your everyday tool because they allow you very easily to measure concentrations. So uh, some people call their specs specky, spocky. Um, I used to call mine Susie. I had a sort of almost a semi-erotic relationship with Susie. Uh, it was, um, you know, I knew exactly when Susie didn't have a good day. And I stayed clear of her. Um, but, you know, when you work with things like that every day, you... Yeah. Okay. Enough said. Anyway, these specs are extremely useful because as long as you know the extinction factor for something, you can measure concentrations. Okay? And that is something that you are going to do in your practical. You will be provided with an unknown concentration of a substance and you have to find out the concentration of this substance. You will measure this substance. You will measure the absorbance or the extinction of this substance. And from this extinction that you measure and you have been given the length of the pathway, you will determine what the concentration is. However, life is a bitch. 
We are not going to give you Epsilon. We will make you suffer. <laughs> but I will show you on Monday how we can overcome this problem if we don't have Epsilon. Have you all signed in? See you on Monday. <laughs>